And it's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Steve Duffin, DDS. He's a general dentist in Kaiser, Oregon. His background is in microbiology and public health dentistry with an emphasis on the care of patients with special needs. He was involved in the early development of the dental program serving clients for the Oregon Health Plan and served as dental director and CEO of Capital Dental Care for 10 years before returning to private practice in 2005. In recent years, Steve has focused on introducing caries management programs utilizing silver ion products in countries in the developing world and uh, my gosh it's it's so amazing because the whole 31 years that I've been a dentist you know the the pediatric dentist there was no controversies with them endodontist I, I, I never I, I never sat at a bar with two endodontists violently arguing about something all all the dilemmas were always an occlusion and the occlusion camps, neuromuscular, they're, they're like world religions, and they just weren't ever going to agree. But now pediatric dentistry has come under this deal because of silver diamine fluoride. It's now an official controversy. We had um, one of your, um, one of our mutual best friends, um, Janet McLean, and she was very upset with some of the remarks that Gordon Christian made about silver diamine fluoride on my podcast. And she, she was like, I mean, I think that it gave her a heart attack listening to what Gordon says. So we have a full-fledged controversy in pediatric dentistry, and you have to be one of the top five experts on the planet in this uh, arena. And for a long time, you made us a CE course all the way back in 2011, which is still relevant today. So, so why is silver diamine fluoride a controversy in 2018? So I believe that um, it's a controversy because people don't understand it. They don't understand the history, how G.V. Black introduced silver ion compounds 100 years ago. And the early dentists used medicine to treat caries. And so we're taught to cut it out surgically and put in a plastic filling material. And so this philosophy goes contrary to that uh, training that we've all received. Yeah, I, um, that was the biggest um, expenditure I made of could not justify it. Some guy was selling the first three books autographed and signed by G.V. Black that he found at an estate sale, and I paid way too much money for him. But it's amazing how... Um, dentistry they're still engineers to me dentists have always been building this uh barn out in the middle of the farm and then they scream and yell at the patients because it's always fails eaten by termites and it seems like the japanese and other people in history have not looked at dentistry as an engineering firm we build bridges we construct crowns they look at it as a biology issue that that the mouth has got you know 10 billion micro per cc of microorganisms, fungi, viruses, plaque, all this stuff like that. And it seems like the, the Japanese, um, you know, they, they, they always looked at fillings like glass onomer more than an earth. And, and, and amalgam, in my lifetime, it really does seem that the uh, dentistry has been moving backwards in restored dentistry. Because when I was in dental school, 83 to 87, everybody had amalgams and gold. And th those amalgams that last 30 years, hell, hell, the amalgam was half mercury. You'll never find mercury in a multivitamin. The other half was silver, which is your expertise, silver diamine fluoride. Um, tin, the hygienist used stannous fluoride. Um, every ingredient in amalgam is antibacterial. And those things last 14 to 38 years, depending on the research. Now, taking them all out, we replace it with an inert plastic. Not only does the, does the data show that they're averaging six and a half years, but the recurrent decay, how do you take it out? With the number four round burr, it's mush. And, and when you tell that to dentist, it's like a religion, like, oh, well, maybe your, maybe your composites don't last long, but my composites last forever. And it's like, dude, are you out of your mind? And uh, so, so, so do you think it was a great idea to switch from amalgam to inert plastic composite fillings? And do you think the composite fillings last as long as the amalgams? So I, bet, I definitely do not believe that composite fillings last as long as amalgams. The question of is it good that we took amalgams away and is the mercury in amalgam actually toxic is a very controversial subject. And it's probably outside of my wheelhouse. Um, I had the good fortune of 
training in microbiology before I went to dental school. So I'm always thinking about the bugs. And I'm thinking about the biofilm and the physiology of bacteria and the role of sugar and acid and demineralization of tooth structure and how can we intervene to stop that process. And so silver has come along and given us another tool to take us down to the level of, of the microbiology. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold your feet to fire and move back to silver diving for you. But do you think um, a, a, mer a silver mercury filling is toxic to a human, the way it's practiced in America today? So I would say I don't have the answer to that. I'm not Dude, an expert. You're the smartest guy I know on the subject. Quit being Oregon humble. I stopped placing amalgam restorations about 13 years ago. Exactly. And I fell into the, the resin camp. But then I also saw the development of the glass ionomer materials. The early ones caught my attention, but they didn't work. Um, I'm fascinated with the newer glass ionomer materials and the combination of silver treatment plus glass ionomer. That's really where my attention is. I, I stopped 99% of my amalgams day one when I got dental school, only because <laughs> everybody in Phoenix wanted whiter, brighter fillings. I mean, there I, and it was weird. I'd say, well, do you want a silver filling or a, or a tooth colored filling? Well, which one lasts longer? Oh, the silver one lasts twice as long as a tooth colored. Okay, I'll take the tooth colored. Okay, why, why did you even ask? What, what, so so I, I have stopped it from a demand issue, but I want to make one clarity because you, you traveled the world teaching people um, preventive dentistry. You're on your way to Bolivia now. Um, and when I'm in, I've lectured in 50 countries, and I've been saying 50 countries. Ryan, <laughs> my son Ryan says, Dad, you've been saying 50 countries since I was in grammar school. And he was doing a list one day. He, 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 got, he got 50 countries, and he was only done with like a couple of the continents. So it's a much bigger list. But you can only do tooth colored fillings if you have a dental assistant and a high speed evacuation and rubber dams and all stuff. And I'll never forget, I don't want to throw a country under a bridge, but it was in Africa. And this dentist, um, he uh, uh, prepped the tooth, he acid etched it, then the patient stood up and swished and then spit in a pickle bucket. And then he put on the, the resin and cured it. And then the patient sat up again, swished, spit in the bucket. Then he put on the composite, cured it. Then he spent like this. 20 minutes putting the most elaborate polish on there and i'm just sitting there like okay this this whole thing is so i i have never seen composites placed correctly unless you're in a dental operatory with high speed suction and a dental assistant so when a bunch of rich dentists in the 20 richest countries get on facebook and and internet and social media and slam how they don't like amalgams they're really doing injustice to four billion out of eight billion earthlings who live in an environment where that amalgam i mean you can place an amalgam that when you condense it blood's coming up out of the top of it and it'll last 20 30 well, years exactly precisely so if you can imagine we one of our projects were, were conducted in ghana ghana is a african country with uh, 28 million people living there and about 200 dentists so essentially there are no dentists in this country. And so we went to a rural area of Ghana and used silver to stop tooth decay in children that with no electricity, no sophisticated equipment whatsoever, we returned at six months and 12 months to collect the outcome data on the progression of tooth decay and the prevention of new, new tooth decay, and it's dramatic, more than 90%. So we showed that we can go to where we don't have all of the sophisticated equipment, and we can, at, very, at the very least, stop the progression of the disease. So to put that in perspective, Ghana's got one dentist for every 140,000 people. <laughs> exactly. America's got one dentist for every 1,850 people, let's say 2,000. Yeah. So, wow, that is amazing. That is just amazing. Um, yeah, so th that, that, is a, uh, that is a beautiful story. Uh, well, so, we're, so we have 70 times the concentration of dentists in Ghana. So it's really hard to make macroeconomic or macro dental statements 
when you're dealing on a planet with 8 billion people in over 200 countries. Where does this come from in you? Why, why, why have you been taking dentistry to the underdeveloped world for your whole career? Where, where does that come from? So I've been very interested in public health dentistry from the very beginning. And I got involved with the development of the Oregon Health Plan in 1994 which was a reconstruction of the Medicaid program in Oregon. And they completely turned it inside out. And from the dental perspective, we, those of us that were interested in low income and Medicaid, we said, how can we reinvent this so that we're not just throwing more money away? And when you think about taking tax dollars and putting it into systems that don't work, that's silly. So we talked about how can we achieve healthy people as the outcome rather than a filling that lasts more than five years. And so it's amazing that I was kind of in the middle of this process when I heard a lecture by Peter Milgram where he talked about this product that's being used overseas called silver diamine fluoride. I had never heard of it before. And this was about 2006. And um, so I got on Google and I got on PubMed and I got some papers about silver fluoride and I contacted a colleague in Japan and I had him mail me a bottle of Saferide. <laughs> and I sat there and I looked at it and I thought about it and I read papers about it and then I eventually got out a microbrush and started treating some cavities. And I was absolutely blown away by what I saw in the early cases. And the, the cases that I started using silver on were the ones that were going to the OR. So these are children with massive advanced early childhood caries scheduled to go to the OR. I had a wait time of three to six months. Many of these kids were getting abscesses. And so I had just hoped to just slow the, the process down. But when I took the kids to the OR to restore all their teeth, what I found was astonishing. The, the regenerative tertiary dentin that had formed underneath the active cavities um, allowed me to dramatically reduce the amount of, of restorative dentistry that I was doing. And eventually, I, I quit going to the OR. I haven't gone to the OR in over 10 years with uh, these children. Well, that's where our buddy... Um... Jeanette McLean, I mean, she's so passionate. I mean, people don't realize that, that kids die from anesthesia. I mean, we're out here in Arizona. Just one city alone in Arizona, Yuma. They lost a little girl um, in December, and three years ago, same damn city, lost another three-year-old. I mean, there is a risk. And, and, then, and then, to put this in a legal-esque point away, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I am a dentist with an MBA, and there's only three publicly traded dental companies in the world. Two are in Australia, um, one 300 Smiles and Pacific Smiles, and one's in Singapore, Q&M. And when they went public, the, the Wall Street boys uh, made them say they can't do any anesthetic on anyone under 16 or over 65, because that's where all the risk occurs. And, and Wall Street didn't want to have some, you know, uh, one 300 smiles have a hundred locations and doing pediatric dentistry and putting kids to sleep because because one one loss of a child not only is that just horrible it, it's just it's it, it's even an economic disaster and so what did you think of um so what do you think of when these pediatric dentists says i'm sorry steve it doesn't work and and i just listened to gordon christian and he's the god of dentistry and he said it doesn't work what, what, what do you what do you say to that they're simply wrong or they have no experience with the product. And so we've been using it for over 13 years on thousands of patients, both within my general practice here in Oregon, which is a typical general practice seeing children and adults of all age groups. We have about a 30% Medicaid population, so a lot of that, all the way to around the world. You know, you ask back to your question, why do I go around the world? Because I see the opportunity of using the medical management of caries with silver ion compounds as an opportunity to address this global pandemic of caries in, in a novel, effective, and co in a cost-effective manner. So, so I'm really excited about uh, the future of this approach to care. 
Okay, Round so um, so let's pretend. I'm sure all the millennials listen to this all know what's going on. Um, but the older guys, I mean, when I go to the bar with my alcoholic dental friends, they're all going to be in their 50s and 60s and eat cheeseburgers and watch beer. None of them have ever used silver diamine fluoride. So let's start, let's start from A. What is it? How do you use it? How do you recommend learning it? Are you going to build us a new course on, on, on Dental Town about this? Your last course was Carrie's Medical Management. It was an outstanding course. Um, I absolutely loved it. Um, it's the medical management of caries. You put it out in 2011. It's still just as good. I watched it um, to review uh, for this one. But um, do you think you'll ever make another um, silver diamine fluoride lecture course? Sure, I would. And uh, a couple of things have changed. One, in 2011, the FDA had not approved silver diamine fluoride for use in the United States. So you could obtain it and use it if you wanted to, but it was not FDA approved. And my presentation had to do with using silver nitrate and fluoride varnish as sort of a um, combination therapy because we had no silver diamine fluoride. As of 2015, that's changed and we do have the product. Um, the product was developed in Japan in the 1970s. Um, by combining the effects of silver nitrate, which is essentially the silver ion antimicrobial properties of the product that GV Black introduced 100 years ago with fluoride. So they combined it, they marketed it as saferide. It took a long time to come to the United States, but now it's here. When did it, there, when did it get FDA approved here? Because there was just, what, what's the name of that company in Florida? The cells elevate elevate. Oral care, um, markets a product which is called Advantage Arrest, which is an identical product to Saferide, which is produced in Japan. But but it, it just very recently, um, only Saferide um, was selling it. But now you're saying um, only Elevate was selling it. But right. now you're saying that um, that now the Japanese product is for sale too. So there's competition. No, the Saferide product has not attempted to enter the American market yet. Um, there is one other manufacturer from Australia, SDI, which has a product called Revastar. Revastar is a combination silver diamine fluoride followed by potassium iodide, which is kind of a novel approach to minimizing the darkening that happens when silver ion is in contact with um, decay. However, um, I will let the marketplace decide who wins out. I personally continue to use silver diamine fluoride. From who? I use from Elevate. So it's manufactured right here in Oregon. <laughs> it's manufactured in Oregon, Elevate is, but sold out of Florida? So, you know, they're a national distribution company, but they, um, at first, brought the um, Saferide product and distributed it and then manufactured it. And um, I suspect there will be a lot of other players in the marketplace. The important thing is that silver is very effective in arresting tooth decay. Period. It's called Safer Wide, one word? No, Saferide. S-A-F-O-R-I-D-E is the product. S-A-F-O-R-I-D-E? From... Correct. Okay. And... Um... And then who, okay, Saferide opened, okay. Um, here, I'll see what comes up with Google. Oh, it's talking about open trials. Um, I want to, um, huh, interesting. Uh, I, I just want to say one thing about um, this. I mean, um, I don't like to talk about religion, sex, politics, or violence because it's so polarizing. I want to keep it on dentistry. But these are strange political times right now and even if you don't like it you you have to understand where is all this anger coming from and as a dentist this anger is coming from me like the fda the, you know the, the abuse of government like the lady i bought this house from she had to move to scandinavia because an american company she had brain cancer an american company had a medicine they started an fda test she couldn't get in on the test the only place she'd go, she had to move to Scandinavia. So she had to, she was an American. 
And then here's an American PhD that comes out with the chemotherapy, but it's the government who made her leave her country and made her go die in another country. I mean, that, that is so sick. And the, if the government was on your side, the FDA could just say, I don't care what you buy, but it's not FDA approved. But they're, they're, not, they're not good with that. They're saying, hey, hey, we haven't approved it. You haven't given us the millions of dollars in the five years, so we don't sell it. I remember sitting with John McCain uh, at a fundraiser with his wife, Cindy, and I told him, I said, you got these Indian reservations, and, and there's all these Mayo clinics and hospitals. Why don't, why don't you make the Indian reservation, instead of just having casinos, why don't you make them an FDA-free zone? We're screw the FDA. So that people dying in America that can't get on some damn list can volunteer with their own money, drive to the Indian reservation, and, and I'm, I'm telling you, the health care system is a cartel. And when you tell dentists that, they, they, don't, like, they, don't, they don't like here. But I, I, I think it's insulting that, as an American, I can't buy silver diamine fluoride from Australia or Japan and use it on my patients. I mean, I can tell my patients this is a new thing. It's, they do this in Japan and Australia. It's not FDA approved by the American government. But I mean, it's just, I mean, that, it's just over-the-top abusive. Howard, I think it's important that we clarify that what FDA approval means. The FDA has approved the um, importation and distribution of silver diamine fluoride for use as a desensitizing agent and a cavity liner. They have not approved it for caries. However, there are large trials being conducted at NYU and the University of Michigan, which hopefully will move the bar so that we can get SDF approved for caries use. Now, you and I can get SDF, and we can treat caries in our practice today, okay? And it's called in an off-label manner. I've been doing off-label procedures for years when I think they're in the best interest of my patients. Okay. So are you, but you're not using the safe ride from Japan on your patients? I'm currently using Advantage Arrest. Advantage Arrest out of? Florida. Okay. And what did you say the name was the one in um, um, Australia? So the uh, product that has just recently received approval uh, is called Reva Star by SDI. I don't know what that stands for, but if they're an Australian company. It, uh, I, I've been there. I've, I've lectured in Melbourne and spent, uh, went to dinner with, it's a family business. The, the old man's turned it over to his daughter, um, SDI, um, Southern Dental Technology. And uh, they used to make over half of the world's amalgam. And uh, j it's just an amazing company. Um, but um, but the, the dentist down there told me that they like their product down there better because the, the American product turns it really a darker color black. And there's a way it sets up with the phosphorus and everything. It's more of a, a charcoal white. So um, you when agree you... with that or disagree with that? I disagree with it. I do not support the use of potassium iodide after silver application because what happens is you create a silver iodine compound which removes the silver ion from the ability to interact with bacteria so in my view i want to put as much silver in front of those bacteria as possible because it's going to kill them and then when the lesion turns dark i can fix that i can cover that dark cavity with a nice white glass ionomer cement there are a lot of things I can do, but I don't want to minimize the antibacterial properties of the free silver ion. Okay, so <clears throat> talk about what the general dentist do now. He, see, he sees a three-year-old. She needs some pulpotomy and chrome steel crowns. Um, she, um, what, what, are, what are you doing differently now? Go, go over so, the technique. Unfortunately, if we see the three-year-old and they need pulpotomies and stainless steel crowns, it's too late. I mean, the nerves are involved. There's infection. They need pulpotomies and stainless steel crowns. That's not going to change that. If we can see the child when the caries is in enamel or in dentin and the pulp is not involved, it's time to get silver on that lesion immediately. And so the protocol is very simple. You basically dry the tooth, dry the cavity, you apply the silver compound directly to the lesion. And then the protocol that I've been fond of is to then cover that with fluoride varnish because that prevents saliva from contaminating the treated area. And 
why do you think this has made a reduction in emergency room visits? Oh, it, just in my practice, okay, after using silver compounds for a couple of years, we eliminated hospital dentistry. We dramatically reduced the number of emergencies that were being seen in my practice because we were able to just put out the fires earlier. So you were putting out the fires earlier that would have led to pulp bottomies and chrome exactly. skulls. Exactly. Precisely. So what, what should the dentist do? How, how should they learn about this today? They, they, they get done listening to you. What, what's their next step to learn about this? So number one, I would recommend visiting uh, our two websites, okay? The first website that we developed, and I want to give credit to my son, Marcus Stuffin, who's the scientist and technology guy. Is built the website. Right next to you? This is, he's here. Well, get, a, get his pretty face on. Oh, how are you doing? Howdy. Oh my God, you got a face for YouTube. Why, why aren't you Why aren't you sitting by your dad the whole time? So what's the <laughs> www of that website? Okay, <laughs> www.mmclibrary. mmclibrary.com. It's M M M C library. Library dot com. And what's the MMC stand for? Medical management of caries. So, oh, nice. And we have placed huge amount of literature on that site. Scientific evidence, references. We have interviews with patients. We have a lot of content. And what percent of it is fake news? Zero. <laughs> Sorry, thanks for asking, but no. <laughs> this is a very good place to learn about this. And then um, the second website that I recommend is called www.mmc.com. N-O-D-K. Right, okay. I, before I go there, I'm, I'm not smart enough to go. I want to go over mmclibrary.com. Search for Medical Management Carries yep. Library. Medical Management Carries Library.com. Okay, right. you got the home, the home page. Then the third button is smart. What's smart? So I clicked that. I thought I'd see a picture of myself, and I did <laughs> not. <laughs> I can we can change that, Howard. <laughs> so what's SMART? Oh, SMART is an acronym which we're hearing more and more about, which stands for Silver Modified Atraumatic Restorative Treatment. So Jeanette has also promoted this idea a lot. And so we're talking about SMART treatments. Okay, say it again. Um, silver yes. Modified Atraumatic Restorative Treatment. Damn, and who thought of that, you or, Jan or Janet? Well, um, uh, let's give Jeanette all the, all of the credit for that. There we go. <laughs> I, I don't remember. But uh, we that love, is, that love is, it. I like it's that. Smart dentistry. And, and let me say, Howard, we are writing a book, and the book will be called Smart Dentistry. Cool? Steve Duffin, Jacqueline Jewell, and yeah. Joseph Schwab. Yeah, we're the editors and this book will come out probably in November, and it's a comprehensive textbook. Uh, Jacqueline, uh, uh, pardon me, Jeanette McLean is a chapter author in the book, and um, so we'll let you know when that uh, occurs. Well, I can, I'd love to push out. I hope, um, maybe, maybe you could do an online CE course and then um, and promote the book there or just posting on it. Send me the pictures and all the information I'll push out in Dentaltown and social media and all that stuff. I'll, I'll try to uh, market the hell out of it for you. Because this send is so the first book. What's that? We'll send you the first book. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it's so important because, you know, it's, it's like my, my two older sisters are nuns. And, and they're really traumatized by all this stuff going on in the Catholic Church. It's been in the news. And, in fact, being 100% Irish... You know, I know you're not supposed to talk about religion, sex, politics, violence, but I, I almost wish everybody would give Sinead O'Connor an apology for how they treat her on CNN 20 years ago because she's from Ireland. She knew what was going on. And, um, and so you got to look at your own industry, dentistry. And this is where people die. This is where little kids die. And everyone who's my age, I mean, I would donate my kidneys to my five-year-old grandson. I mean, I would rather die in a minute than my grandchild and these grandchildren i mean when you see someone die especially in arizona when they die in a damn dental chair they're almost always under six and that yeah. is just horrible 
And the thing is, we can stop that because we have a new tool that allows us to treat the disease atraumatically without sedation. It's very effective and it can help every kid in America that is being traumatized by what we were taught to do. Yeah, which is an engineer physically, mechanically cutting everything out of a rock and restoring it with, you know, wood and lumber and and all this stuff, as opposed to treating it as a biological infection. Correct. Kind kind of like substance abuse. They treat that as a religious moral issue instead of the medical management of disease. I mean, someone, someone, it it doesn't do any good to go sit in prison for five years because you got caught with meth. But it'd make really good sense 30, 60, 90 days with therapy. You know what I mean? Right. But anything after that, now you're just being uh, mean. So, so you, you're saying we really need to switch more from being an engineer dentist to a biologist, a microbiologist. Exactly. We need to bring biology back into our profession in a big way. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about my buddy, Gordon Christen, who I love. Um, but, um, he disagreed with you. Did, did you get to hear the, that podcast or any of his comments or, um, or is there any, any specifics you could address on that to educate Gordon and Rella, how you think differently? So, so we apparently think differently, but let me just tell you a little story. Soon after I discovered the miracle of Saferite in my practice, and I was so excited about what I was seeing This is in about 2008 or 2009. The first thing I did was get on an airplane and fly to Provo, Utah with a bottle of this product from Japan and handed it to Rella. Gordon wasn't available and told her about this miracle that I was seeing in my practice and with the hopes that they would study it and look at it. And apparently they have and we've come up with different opinions. Um, And you might say that I'm supporting the opinions of the clinicians like Jeanette McLean and and John Fraschella, et cetera. And we have scientists like Jeremy Horst, who is strongly advocating for this. So, you know, Rella and Gordon are going to take their own path, and I respect them, but hopefully they'll come around. (laughs) Yeah, and that's where I love, uh, you know, Dentaltown is um, a a lot of people don't understand freedom of speech. A lot of people get really upset when we edit or ban the remark and they say, oh, I have freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is between you and the government. You have the right to go hold a sign in front of the White House. But if you walk in my house, I have the right to shoot you. And on Dentaltown, we have a report abuse button. So when you guys, um, good people, good, honest, good, moral people disagree. And, and, but it's when it goes below the belt. I mean, I mean, it, and, and that's why, um, but, but, you know, these debates are healthy. because That's what I love about Dentaltown. Someone will just post something obvious to me. Right. And then the next guy will disagree with a point that I never even thought of. And it's like the more I read Dentaltown, the dumber I feel because the dentists are so damn smart. And they just tear this stuff up and shred it to pieces. Sometimes I'm reading these threads. It's like I'm not even smart enough to be in, in reading these debates. And it's amazing um, how they shut this stuff up. Go back. You said you had two websites. You talked about the first one. Second, right. The second website is nodk.com. www. nodk.com. Okay. And this is, again, a very rich source of um, and, demonstration. And NODK stands for no shots, no pain? Or what, what, what do you get NODK? NO stands for no. What's the DK? So NODK is the name of this little device, which was invented by who? Come on, Marcus. This guy right here. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> well, if you're such a good dentist, why is your son wearing a denture? Because his teeth look too perfect <laughs> to be his natural. Teeth are perfect, yeah. Because he's a dentist. <laughs> so, so I said, Mar- Marcus was in graduate school in Connecticut, and uh, I said, hey, Marcus, we're just having this amazing experience in the dental practice, and I want to be able to take it to the rest of the world. Uh, you know, where there's no electricity and no dental offices and that sort of thing. And, and I asked Marcus to, to figure out how to do that. And so he invented this device that contains silver diamine fluoride and fluoride varnish. And it allows an operator working anywhere in the world to treat cavities atraumatically 
inexpensively. And so my new passion is to take this message and this product, NODK, to the rest of the world. Now, what's your son's name? Marcus. M-A-R-C-U-S? Yes. Is that because you're a big fan of Marcus Welby, the, the show when you were little? His mom named him. Well, we'll just say it was Marcus Welby. That was one fine show. And he's as handsome as Marcus Welby. Um, Marcus, uh, email me any of these YouTube videos that you want taped onto the end of this podcast. Because a lot of people are driving. You know, a podcast is a multitask. sale. probably 85% are on an hour commute to work. And, um, and then the rest are the poor bastards on a treadmill or a Stairmaster, and I, uh, I pity those guys. Uh, but anyway, um, so like a video on this NODK or I- any videos you want. Your, your dad sent me one YouTube video link, but, I mean, I would personally want to see a YouTube video on this. So any, any videos you want, just email them to me, and we'll sure. attach them onto that deal. And then we post, and when, we post them on Dental, when we post this on Dentaltown, have you posted any of these videos on Dentaltown? Marcus? I don't believe so. Marcus. No. Yeah, yeah, I'm back. Sorry. So if you went to pediatric dentistry, you can make a thread on, on your dad and what he's done. And then when you make a post to YouTube, um, when you go to YouTube, when you hit share, you know how there's a link, a YouTube share? There's mm-hmm. also another one, embed, and it has the code. So then on oh, the message oh, board, okay. you, cl- you click the YouTube link, drop the embedded code in there, and now your YouTube video is um is, is there in the message board and then with youtube when the youtube video just gets played in search from people that live around your house or your office or your business it doesn't get good seo but when dentists start clicking that youtube video from all around the world that seo will go crazy so then when some dentist is searching youtube or is on youtube google's going to show them those videos and thank you to the 8200 dentists who have subscribed to uh um um, youtube.com forward slash dentaltown magazine um, I mean that that's like doubled in the last year from like 4,000 8,000 so yeah so post all those videos start start a thread under pediatric dentistry because um, Jeanette I feel sorry for Jeanette McClain because she's been on on dentaltown standing up to all these old guys and she needs some help and uh, and you're no spring chicken see I'm 56 how old are you yeah I'm um, I'm uh, 63 well, the guys throwing all the crap are our age. So right. it would be really great if you went in there and helped set up them because I think it's sometimes it's just tough for young millennials to stand up to a bunch of prestigious, you know, 50, 60-year-old pediatric dentists and stand up to them. And, and, and I love your YouTube videos. In fact, by the way, if you go to your YouTube app and just type in uh, Steve Duffin, D-U-F-F-I-N-D-D-S, God, you have, how many videos do you have on there? Who knows? A lot. Yeah, well, you, you ought to put them all in one thread. You ought to call it the Steve Duffin thread. <laughs> no, I, I'm dead serious. It'll explode your views, your information they need to hear. And, mm-hmm. and whenever you get inside a tribe, you know, a tribe always has their leaders, their cultures, their customs, and their followers, and they don't like any change. And right now, the pediatric dental tribe is a bunch of old guys like us, and a lot of them are not listening. And now they're God. Gordon Christian. I mean, if you're Muslim, you go to Mecca. If you're a dentist, you go to Provo. I mean, I've been there a dozen times right. uh, to go kneel at uh, Gordon and Rella's feet. Love them to death. They're like my dental mom and dad. In fact, he's got three kids, two are dentists, one's a hygienist. I'm the same age as, as those guys, and um, he, he's not buying into this. And, and so it's a tough fight. And, uh, and that's why, who's that uh, other guy you um, said? That's um, what this book, Karen. We got to have the book. Yeah, and I'll market the crap out of that for you. That other guy, Jeffrey Horst, or yep, Jeremy Horst at UCSF, amazing. Yeah, can guy. you can you get him to you know maybe we should do a one two three punch. The podcast next should be him, and then the one after should be that um, that um, who's that uh, other dentist you said from uh, University of Washington, Peter Milligram. Yeah, yeah. Are you are you friends with him? I am friend. I am friends with Peter and Jeremy. Jeremy studied under Peter at the University of Washington, and um, they're, they're both very influential in bringing this product here to America. Well, let's, I, do, let's um, do a one, two, three punch. Let's just boom, boom, boom. Let's do Jeremy and Peter, um, you know, following up because, again, what makes me just sad is that in my sacred sovereign profession in dentistry, 
when I see a three-year-old die because they had to drag her to the OR, I mean, that's just, that's horrible. And that needs to stop first. Who cares if you do a composite on mom and it lasts six and a half years because it's tooth colored instead of 38 years because it's silver colored when she's wearing silver earrings, a silver band, and has a silver bar through her tongue. Um, but uh, gosh darn, when her kid dies in the OR, that, that is just. That's the stuff. So we need to take a handpiece down and pick this up. <laughs> nice. So, 1901 microscope. So, so when we were little and got out of school, Dr. Keyes was going around the country, and he was setting up these light-based microscopes, and we were taking swabs out, and I did that in 87, 88, 89, and I was sitting there thinking, how did, why did we stop doing it? I do remember we moved it to the back room. It was in the lab. and it sat, But what did you think about the Keys method? And Because when you would do that, and it'd be the first time, like when you use an intro camera, it's the first time the patient's seen the back of their own teeth. When you do a digital x-ray and say by 10, that's so much better than a little film. But man, when we used to do the Keys technique and they would see all these things running around and crawling around and live bugs in their mouth, they became microbiologists. What, what do you think of Dr. Keyes' technique and why did that leave dentistry? I love it. And I think the reason it left is because the economics did not support it. Now, what we're suggesting now as we approach to and we're trying to reintroduce prevention, okay? We need to have the correct financial support for doing that. And in the textbook, we have a whole section on policy and economics. And there has to be a shift away from procedure-based fee-for-service revenue to capitation-based outcome measurements. So when dentists are making the same amount of money and they're not at risk, and they can do something that's better and save children, we all win. Okay, but now now I gotta call um, Baloney Filoni on, because yeah. um, I lived through this just like you do. So basically in a nutshell, um, the insurance companies are not at the table with the dental, like even the American Dental Association. I podcast the executive director, their head economist, uh, they, they don't even have access to Delta Dental probably files 20% of all the claims in dentistry. And that data is not transparent to the providers. And that's because it, it's kind of like the Israeli-Palestinian issue. They've just never had a good faith, open talk relationship. And that's been really sad. But when the insurance companies evaluated capitation at the time, it was pretty much a good round number that the dental insurance was costing $20 a month per person. And they wanted to switch from this procedure fee for service to an overall health model where we'll just give you a lump amount and then that would take away the incentives to drill, fill, and build procedures. And now you'd have an incentive just to keep your patient happy. And I lived through when they, they did this, but they cut the money transfer from $20 a head per person, which is average, to eight. And even if you round that to 10, and I would go around to these insurance guys and I'd say, man, I loved all the philosophy of what you said. Quit giving them incentives to drill, fill and bill, and place fillings and crowns, and just give them the money to keep them healthy so they're incentivized for preventive, but you cut the revenue in half. Correct. So it's, you, so it's like they never, ever tried the system. I mean, no economist would say that that was a test model. I mean, cap capitation was tried and failed miserably, but because, it was because they cut the revenue in half. Because the insurance companies were still in control of it. And you're absolutely correct. They cut the revenue in half and the provider did not get the $20. So what did I do when I went into practice in 2005? I cut out the insurance company. I, as a dentist, went to the state of Oregon and said, if you will take the $20 per month you're paying the insurance company and give it to me and cut out the insurance company, I will take care of them. And I will guarantee that they will be healthy. And that worked. I did that in 2006. 12 years later, we're doing the same thing. We don't have an insurance company involved. Well, why don't you write an article on that for Dental Town Magazine? So there's a whole chapter. I'd be happy to. There's a whole chapter in the book coming out. Or maybe write yeah. an article on a book review. Why don't, why don't you write an article for Dental Town Magazine? I think it's so funny how people say that print is dead. It's always the nuances. You, you know what's dead is people paying 
for a newspaper? Why would you pay for a newspaper when you can open up your iPhone and go to Google News or Apple News? But I, I tell the local newspaper here, I said, well, I, you're going the wrong way. Your subscriptions are going down. So now your circulation is going down. So now your advertising is going down. If I owned a newspaper today, I'd start throwing the Sunday newspaper on every house in the city. They're monkeys. You throw the damn Sunday newspaper out there, they're going to go out there and pick it up. And if there's interesting stuff, they're going to read it. They're just not going to pay for it. And uh, that Dental Town magazine, I cannot believe how the viewership just keeps going up and up and up and up. And I think a million years from now, monkeys are still going to want to sit in rocking chairs, drink warm liquids out of a cup, and hold stuff with their, their little sausage fingers and read it if it's, it's engaging. So um, write an article about, write, write yourself a book review of your new book. And then we have the podcast and I'll push it all out on social media. And we'll try to, we'll try to get this, um, this pediatric dental ship to start slowly turning around and going the other way. And, and back to the insurance companies, I just want to say one thing with the insurance companies. I learned it from my father. You network with the value chain. You, you'll go, like I'm lecturing in Ohio next week. And uh, my God, I, the whole room, not one person will know who the, the um, Delta director of Ohio is. Um, you know, you'll go, in, you'll go into a dental office in Arizona and say, okay, Ar the Arizona, um, Delta Dental of Arizona last year gave you $250,000. Who's the director? I don't know. Have you ever had lunch with him? No. Oh, well, actually, you communicated with him three times this year. And here's the three letters you wrote to him because he didn't cover whatever the hell you were saying. And look at the profanity. And look at the meanness. And then you, and, and I, remember, I remember, I'll never forget walking into CDA and I almost cried because the night before I was drinking with the CEO of Delta Dental, an amazing guy who, who was so happy because he passed selling $1 billion of dental insurance in CDA. But when he opens up the program, they got Bill Dickerson speaking. And guess what the name of his lecture is? Delta or the devil. And they have never, ever once asked him to speak at the CDA telling him what it's like on his side. I mean, if, if, Dennis, if Dennis want crowns covered in a million dollars, great, well, you go to Intel and Oracle and Microsoft and you, you sell them the damn dental insurance where they're gonna pay $1,000 a week per, per employee. And I mean, I mean, den dentists, are, they're just irrational. But when you go outside of healthcare and government, you work the value chain. When my dad had restaurants, he bought a million dollars a year of meat from a guy. Well, hell, we went on family vacations with that guy. We, I knew his wife and kids, and you all work together on the value chain. And then in dentistry, it's like, me, 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 self, 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 me, me, self, self, me, 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 self. Screw the insurance companies. Screw everybody. It's all about me. And then they want to know why insurance companies. And then here you are, where you actually picked up the phone and went and met this guy, and he trusted you, and you trusted him, and you guys did a deal together. Yeah, it's still working. 12 years later. Yeah, because we'll, we'll still be humans a million years from now. That's what works. What doesn't work is when you've never pressed the flesh with this guy. You're never running for mayor. You never took him to lunch. I remember the first time I took the Arizona uh, Delta Dental executive director lunch. His name was um, um, Ed Judd. And it took me like five calls, and they, they wouldn't even push me through with them. He thought it was some kind of trick. And he <laughs> said, he said what, what, why do you want to meet me? I said, dude, I mean, I, it's 1987. I've, I've only been open a year. I mean, you've given me several hundred thousand dollars. I, 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 I would have lunch with you. He said, I'll meet you at Black Eyed Peas. And, and he was brisk. And then we went to Black Eyed Peas, and the whole time he was feeling me out. like. And then finally he realized this is a 24-year-old punk-ass kiss, and, he, and he's truly grateful and recognizes what we do for him, which is going around to all these companies in Arizona and selling them dental insurance. And, and, and dentists just need to get their head screwed on. Say, I want to I go t uh, talk about another black eye for dentistry. 8%, they just come out with another study in Arizona, 8% of emergency room visits several years in a row now in Arizona are, are odontogenic in origin. I just I went to dinner uh, with um, Chris Vogel's a dentist in public health for 30 years. Why are 8% of emergency room visits in Arizona, odontogenic in origin. And he told me that the numbers were pretty much the same nationally. Mm -hmm. So people are not going to the dentist. They're either afraid or they don't have the money for it or what the dentists are doing is not effective. And so they go to the hospital. The hospital is a last resort. It's sad. 
And all they do is give them Pen VK and Vicodin. Right. And and the cost is fifteen hundred bucks. It's, and I'm it's, like, if that emergency room would have sent him to my office and given me 1500 bucks, what's the chance I could have had a higher outcome of treating the disease missing and filled tooth? So, Howard, what we're promoting is the concept that a dental hygienist can apply SDF um, in collaboration with the dentist, of course, earlier and stop the disease before there's a need to go to the OR or go to the emergency room. And so we want to partner with hygienists in the introduction of this technology. Oh my God, you just opened up another can of words because uh, now it's dental therapist. And, and if you support that, yeah, but- you're somewhere between a communist, a Putin lover. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. And so I just want to tell the young kids that the, the only advantage of being 55 is that um, you've lived through this rodeo. So we go back to 50 years ago, there was a guy named uh, Barker. Uh, what was his first name? Uh, Bob Barker. Bob Barker. Going Barker. around trying to tell everybody to hire these hygienists. And the, it's the same backlash to dental therapist days it was then. And they're like, look, I don't have time for this stuff. I'm too busy pulling everybody's seat to indentures. And who the hell are you promoting these dental hygienists that are taking away our dental rights and, and, and there should never be dental hygienists. And it was just a war. And Bob fought the right. dental monkeys. And now right. 50 years later, if you go to any dental office, say, hey, you wanna fire your dental hygienist and do all your cleanings? They all say, well, hell no. Well, that's what you all said 50 years ago. So now comes along a dental therapist. Well, what's she going to do? She's going to do some fillings. And, and I go to wherever they have them, and Dennis says, oh, my God, they're great. I, I used to do all my cleanings, and I got two hygienists doing all the cleanings. And I used to do all my fillings, and I got two dental therapists. They numb. They do, they do the damn filling. And I'm just over here doing the big stuff, doing molar endos and dentures and and implants and crowns. And I have not seen a single dentist who hired a dental therapist who doesn't just love it. But my God, you go on social media and say that I'm for dental therapists and they would lynch you if they could. Why is that? Um, Fear, fear. And, And it's in your rational fear. You know, if we can shift our way of thinking about intervening with this disease earlier, doing it using a medical model, a biological model, the, the benefits go to the patients. And if we can stay alive financially at the same time, so if we can shift the reimbursement so that it supports that type of intervention, then I think the, the blood pressure and the concern of the dentist is gonna go down. Man, you're a politician. You, you should be the mayor. Uh, you called them irrational fails. I just would have called them complete idiots. But I love the way you just stayed somber, irrational fear. Uh, you're, you're a polished guy. Um, I want to talk about, um, let's see, I, uh, I've already got 52 minutes. I, I got you for four or five more minutes. Um, two other big things in the, in the news and dentistry got to cover. Um, there's a big measles outbreak. And so now there's some local dental offices here in, at Phoenix and, and on social media that said, if your kid's not vaccinated, you can't bring him in here. Um, the anti-vaxxers are kind of, in my opinion, they're like the anti-water fluoridationists. Um, I've been involved in two fluoridation campaigns for Phoenix. In 89, the Arizona State Dental Association gave me the Arizona Award for outstanding contribution to bring water fluoride to Phoenix. And back then, I would say it was about 70-30, 30% of the Arizonas thought it was a communist plot, that uh, I was only doing this because I knew it made the teeth mottled and break down and they'd need a bunch of crowns and all this crap. But 70% trusted the dentist, the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health, the dental schools. And then 20 years later, we did it again. It was the same percentage. And now it's the same with the vaccination deal. So when you study any epidemiologist and they go back, so this is 2018. So if we went back a century, uh, to 1918, we would have already gone through the Civil War, I mean, not the Civil War, the uh, World War I, and the Spanish Influenza. And you would think that today they would be licking their chops thinking that we'll never have that, you know, that these vaccines, it's been credited as the number one public health measure is uh, in the top 10 Centers for Disease Control's top 10 public health measures last century, water fluoridation makes a list, and so does vaccinations. 
Right. And now you got 30% of Americans saying that vaccinations cause autism. And so, so, so what are your thoughts on water fluoridation? What right. are your thoughts on vaccinations? And what are your thoughts? Uh, do dentists really, what do you think of when a dentist says, I don't want your unvaccinated child in my office? Well, so I fully support the science and the practice behind vaccinations and public health interventions. I support the fluoride pro uh, programs that we have in America, and the 30% of people that don't want any fluoride in their children's mouth, those, those patients come to my office. And so I have this conversation, I, I don't want any fluoride, you know. So what do I do when the parent says no fluoride in my child's mouth? I pick up a bottle of silver nitrate, just like G.V. Black did in 1908, and I paint silver nitrate on the cavity, and it stops just like it does with silver diamine fluoride. So if you support fluoride, you get SDF. If you don't support fluoride, then you get silver nitrate. I have something for both camps. That's and nice because, because the, I mean, they're humans. You got to love them. I mean, I do. I, I love my, my, my favorite patient. My favorite patient at today's Zettel is when I go to work and she's sitting outside in my office in her wheelchair with an auction tube smoking to the last minute. <laughs> and, you know, some people would sit there and just like, want to throw her under a bus. Hell, she's the most adorable lady I've got in my whole practice. You just love, I love crazy people. And, um, they, and you know, when they, they, they don't understand for it. I mean, I mean, I tell them all the time, I've told this story a million times, the whole universe, almost all hydrogen. And sometimes it gets together in a big ball and it collapses and you know, like it gets attracted with gravity and it gets so big like the sun that, that the gravity is so intense that two hydrogen are pushed together into helium. And that, that, causes the, the sun it's a it's a fusion uh reaction and then when all the hydrogen's burned out and turned into helium it's so damn heavy it collapses explodes and that's where silver and fluoride and mercury they're all made and without that you wouldn't exist and fluoride is the 13th most common element of the earth's crust it shows up in the ocean at 1.4 part per million and when we put it in the water just half that amount the teeth are so much healthier. Correct. And then they email, and then they just say, look, look, I, I, I hate fluoride. And it's like, well, they've never found a water supply, ever found out fluoride. In fact, bottled water made from reverse osmosis has fluoride in it. Just not at the optimum level of, of what we want, 0. 0.7. And, and, and I feel sorry for you because you're, no, no, no uh, don't mean to throw you in a bus, but you're in Oregon. <laughs> I, I've been to Oregon several times. Those right. are some of the, um, describe the people of Oregon, how they're different than the people. Arizona is basically the Florida of the West. Um, how, so how is Oregon different than Florida, Arizona? So I think all the hippies, you know, that are still around, they migrated, they escaped to Oregon, and they have some very uh, unusual political and philosophical views of the world, and fluoride is part of that. So I don't want to battle with those people. I want to understand them, and I want to help them be healthy. And so we can do that. Yeah, and, 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 and I also want to tell you about the uh, fluoride toothpaste because all over the news this week about there's a couple of New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Business Insider, that fluoride is basically, if there's not fluoride in the toothpaste, it's not effective. And uh, I just want to say that, my God, look at the research closely because – if you just brush for two minutes without any toothpaste, with a soft bristle toothpaste, that's really, really good. And if they don't want fluoride, I mean, uh, in, their, in their toothpaste, I mean, my, my problem in Phoenix is that they just don't uh, brush their teeth, period. And if they do brush, maybe it's every other day, but God, if, I'd, I'd rather have someone brushing for two minutes every morning and every night without any toothpaste than come in my office not brushing, carrying a Mountain Dew. In fact, when they walk in my office with a Mountain Dew, I say, do, do you take your bong to church? <laughs> right. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you don't carry Mountain Dew into a damn dental office. I mean, it's so, it's so diet. What, what do you think the top major variables of DK is? Uh, one, one of the most interesting threads. I only got you up for one more minute, but I wish you would weigh in on this. And this would be a good place to post your video. There, there is an amazing thread on Dentaltown that's got some of the most smartest people on Dentaltown posting on it. And they're really having a Zen-like discussion based on research. And it's called, um, um, here, let me look at it. Uh, where is that? 
I think I, uh, I think I scrolled past. Let me go back to the top. Okay. Um, hang on one second. Oh, the question is, do you think tooth decay is mostly based on diet, water fluoridation, brushing two minutes twice per day, or flossing before bedtime? And 105 dentists have posted what they think really causes decay, and they're posting literature and resources. And what I love about this is some really smart people are disagreeing, and they're really trying to do just go to Dental Town, um, yep. and it's under um, Cariology. So, um, and, uh, but my God, what a place for you to start weighing in. Uh, I can't believe we've uh, talked for an hour. Is there any question I wasn't smart enough to ask or forgot or you're wishing I would ask? It's a pleasure to talk with you, Howard. And I will only leave one last comment. There's a third website called how to end tooth decay and gum disease.com. So it's www. Dot how to end tooth decay and gum disease dot com. Okay, my sausage fingers are having a problem. How God dang it, how to end tooth decay. Let me say now I, I typed in Ruth decay. Yeah. <laughs> tooth how to end tooth decay and and gum, gum disease disease dot com D I S E A S C dot yes. com Yes. This is the story oh, by of David Dr. Noel. Dr. David Noel, good friend of mine, dental director of the state of California's Medicaid program for twenty five years. This is an inspirational story about he and his special needs daughter and what we can do to end tooth decay and gum disease. Everybody should watch it. Well, let's get him on the show. Yeah, is absolutely. He a he, he's a lot more famous than I am. <laughs> well, I don't know, man. You put out that course on Dental Town, and you're, um, you're a legend in my mind, and you're a legend on so many people on Dental Town's mind. That course was viewed a gazillion Thanks. times, and... Um, I just, uh, I love the fact that, you know, that you have the freedom to stand up for what you believe, even though a lot of older pediatric dentists, and, and you wonder about the money involved too. I mean, um, there, I mean, there's a lot of money in doing pulpotomies and chrome steel crowns all day long. Yeah. And, um, you know, um, so, uh, but, uh, thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. You're headed to Bolivia. When are you going to Bolivia next? Um, I'm going to Bolivia on, uh, next Monday. I'll be there three weeks. And then my next trip is to India. So we're going around the world. And what are you going to be doing in Bolivia? So we are going to be collecting two-year data on a cohort of 600 children who had the worst tooth decay I've ever seen in my life in a small town close to Cochabamba, Bolivia. So uh, this is going to be a really interesting data collection trip. And that's a tough country because they're poor and they're landlocked. They don't have any access to the ocean. So and they have lots of sugar, lots of sugar. Oh, my gosh. And when you go to look, countries like China, the people that live within 500 miles of the sea, they get all that seafood, fluoride, protein. And the average boy in China within several hundred miles of the ocean is like 5'9". But by the time you get 1,500 to 2,000 miles into mainland China, they're much smaller people right. because they don't have any of that protein source. It's really, really... Um, it's really, really tough to have a really big, healthy diet when you're landlocked like Bolivia. Yeah. And, and I also want to say one thing about actually going to these countries. I'll never forget the first time I lectured in India. I had this thing in my mind that Indians were the healthiest people. They were, they were Hindus. They didn't eat meat and they were I ate vegetables. And I was just expecting to go there to see all these vegans eating so healthy in the world. My God, every dentist house you went to, his wife or his mom or grandma would meet you at the front door with a tray of all these sugar cookies and snacks and sweets. When they drank tea, they put so much sugar. I mean, I, I, I was blown away. I, I, I came back and said, my God, India eats more sugar than Americans do. I mean, so, so you can think all these thoughts about a country, but when you go there, and that's why I like going there is um, 
I don't want to stay in Holiday Inns and all that. I want to stay with dentists in their house. I'll never forget the first time I lectured in Poland. They were going to put me up to this expensive hotel in downtown Warsaw. I told them, I said, no, dude, I want to stay with, at your house. <laughs> and I'll never forget waking up in the morning and going to that refrigerator in Warsaw, Poland, open the refrigerator. I was stunned. I mean, it didn't look like anything I'd ever seen in America. It was all sausages and tomatoes, and it was just... It was like I landed on a different planet. But uh, thank you so much for all that you've done for Dennis Reed. Thank you so much for going back to Bolivia and doing this cohort study and collecting data on 600 children two years later. You're just one hell of a dude. Thank you so much for doing that book. Write a book review of it. We'll put it in Dentaltown. I will market the bejesus out of that book and hope that uh, everything you're doing can um, take dentistry to the next level. Thank you for all you've done for dentistry, Howard. And thank you for today. All right. Thank you. Thank you.